today I'm here at the Civil War Battlefield of Chickamauga and I'm about to learn more about this battle through a Ranger Guided Tour. That's coming up next. out my thought process back there a while ago. Why do you think uh, why do you think you see so many Union monuments here and not Confederate with this being a Confederate victory? Okay, we were talking about that the Union armies had lots more money than the South. Exactly. That's what say. And that close, this thing being established that close to the end of the war, the South still doesn't have any money. But yet again, that just that is just a testimony to what these men wanted us to learn today. I mean, think about it. You went to a place, I used this analogy with a lady not long ago. I said, if you know, if, if me and this lady here, we were, we were championship boxers, world championship boxers, and we come to a place to fight the championship fight, and she beats my eyes out while we're there. And yet, I'll go back home and I'll have me one of these big old monuments made, and I'll take it back down there and put it where she beat my eyes out. Is that the way a human thinks now? You know, back then probably either. I mean, probably wouldn't have done that. Uh, it's just, like I say, I think it's just, you know, these men wanted us to see uh, today what this country went through, what these, these men went through, what these men's families went through, uh, and, and we can learn and or study and hopefully learn from it today is what, what I think they want us to do. So, uh, so here now we're standing here on the Brotherton uh, farm, uh, but we're going to step back a day. You know, we're going to go back down back to the 19th uh, just to give you an idea of just how hard this fighting was here on the 19th. You know, we were talking about Wilder's Brigade and Lily. They were a very special uh, group here on this battlefield. They're the ones that actually had the Spencer repeating rifles. Uh, you know, there was two, two groups here that had a type of repeating rifle. That was Wilder's group that had the Spencer 7-shot, and then the 21st Ohio had the um, Colt revolving rifle. Basically, that was a cap and ball pistol with a, a stock and a long barrel on it. But Wilder's group was, you know, <coughs> they were a force to be reckoned with because if you think about it, these men, 99.9% uh, .9 of these men out here on this battlefield either, Confederates had British-made infields, and the, and the Union guys had uh, the, the American-made Springfield. Uh, these two type of guns in the hands of a, a veteran soldier that had uh, battle experience, they were expected to load, be able to load and fire those guns accurately three times per minute or once every 20 seconds. And that would be a feat in itself, you know, in a situation like we just described up there a while ago. Now this Spencer, in the hands of a soldier that had experienced the battle before, uh, he was expected to shoot that gun at least 14, maybe plus times per minute. That's going to be a lot of difference in firepower. And that will be demonstrated just about another mile and a half to two miles down the road here at the Vineyard Field. Uh, during that day, uh, well actually what Wilder had did after they, and that, that tells you again how many Confederates are trying to pour across that bridge too, that they actually took that bridge away from them. So after they lost the bridge, they'll come back up the Alexander Bridge Road and they'll get on the Vineyard Alexander Road and come west. Well, eventually they will cross over the Lafayette Road and the 19th they'll be found in the woods on the west side of the Vineyard Field. And one point during the day, some of Benning's Confederates will kind of cross the road in a southeast or southwest direction. And when they get in range, Wilder says, fire at will. Well, 
a lot of things can be said here at this point. Um, if you back up, has anybody ever been up Interstate 24 from, from Chattanooga going to Nashville? You know there where Bell Buckle and War Trace exit is? You ever noticed that little better graveyard up there on the hill? Next time you go by there, look, check that out. That is actually Hoover's Gap, where, you know, we were talking about Tullahoma there a while ago. That graveyard is a byproduct of Wilder and those Spencers. That is the first time they've used those guns. Now, by the time they get down here, you know, they, they uh, out on this field here, and he tells them to fire at will. And these guys have seen a lot of awful things before already. Uh, not only that, but even before they got those rifles. Sure. But when he told them to fire at will, one of his men recorded that he said, within two minutes there was not a man standing in my front. And Wilder himself would say that it was a pity to kill men so. He said, I almost had it in my heart to tell my men to stop. And not only that happened, but some of those men come out on that field there and they get there's a ditch, what we call the ditch of death today. It's just a little low spot that runs around through there. A lot of those guys got pinned down in that ditch. And here comes Lily out with two of those guns of his, those cannons, and they'll load it with canister and double canister. They, does everybody know what canister is? Canister round is basically think of it as one of the quart cans of Campbell's tomato soup. You saw them in the grocery store. Imagine that one of those filled with about 26 or 27 iron golf balls. Yeah. And when you say canister, that is one of those shoved in that can. And if you say double canister, that's two of them shoved in that thing. So that turns that gun into what? A, a massive yeah. what? Shotgun. Shotgun. They will rake that ditch. Mm. It is literally a meat grinder down there on Vineyard Field. Every battlefield claims to have one of these fields where you can walk across the field and never touch the grass. Two weeks after this battle, Wilder will actually do an interview in one of the Indiana newspapers, and he said that the exact thing. He said you could actually walk across that field down there and never, ever touch a blade of grass because there were men piled in heaps. So that's the kind of thing. Uh, the 20th, you know, is not going to be a whole lot better. If you notice while ago when we came out of there on Battle Line Road, you came out into that field and you saw the Georgia Monument sitting down in the south end of the field there. You notice all those cannons that were lined up on the right hand side there. Uh, imagine this, this just shows you how much those men uh, thought about what, you know, uh, actually that's not the, the right word, how dedicated they were to their cause. That is the Georgia Monument. And if you notice that little spire when we turned the curve before we came out of the woods, basically that little spire over there on the left, that's the Alabama State Monument. So those Alabama and Georgia troops there during a period there during the 20th came out of those woods from kind of down here in the southeast corner marching toward those 19 federal cannons up there. And if they could have heard those gunners up there uh, calling out the, the uh, charges, they would have heard them calling canister, double canister. Ambrose Spears, anybody ever read any of Ambrose? I, I call him the Stephen King of 1860. He's on the Union staff and he's writing down what he sees there when this happens. He said for five minutes those cannons lit up and they fired as fast as they could. Now how fast can a a artillery crew fire a cannon. <laughs> the same as a, one, a man firing one of those muskets so three times per minute or once every 20 seconds. They fired five minutes as fast as they could fire. There's about 750 men coming out on that field. Ambrose said those cannons started up and he said there was a great ascension of dust and smoke. And he said after it was over with and the dust and the smoke settled, he said those men were still on the field. He said some of them were at the mouths of the cannons. But he also said there was not a man on his feet. We do know that there was one man that was on his feet. That was Hugh, the older gentleman in uniform there behind the desk. His great grandfather was there in the 38th Alabama. That's the reason he was sitting up there today. I just think that's just so neat. I mean, yeah. but, uh, 
<laughs> that's the kind of thing that's happening. So, coming back here now to the 20th, where we're standing here. I'd like say this is the Brotherton cabin. Now, that morning, uh, what was happening that morning? Anybody tell me? From, okay. from daylight till 9 30. Breakfast. Breakfast, chopping wood. Leaving, eating, nothing was happening. Yeah. Chopping wood. So during that time now, I drew a line right through this gap right here, back over that direction there, about three quarters of a mile. Over there on the McDonald farm, up on the hill there, that's where Rosecrans had established his headquarters. He had been out here that morning writing this line, making sure that everybody knew, basically he's writing that question mark. Making sure that everybody is in their positions and he knows that they are. He rides back over to his headquarters. And uh, at 9.30 the battle starts up. And just as Thomas had figured, you know, that it did start up there where we were at first. And he had made the comment the night before, if, if it does start up here and it gets pretty intense, I'm going to be calling for reinforcements pretty quickly. So that's exactly what he did. He will send his actual nephew, Mr. Callow, to Rosecrans telling him, send me reinforcements up here. So. That is where you've got to come up here to the map again. We are standing right here at the Brotherton House here. That road right here is that one right there. The fighting starts up here. Uh, Rosecrans headquarters is back in this vicinity here. So, fighting starts here. Uh, Thomas tells, I'm trying to make this as clear as mud. Thomas sends uh, Negley, or Negley, not Negley, but Mr. Kellogg to Rosecrans headquarters telling me I need reinforcements up here. So as Kellogg is riding by, he, Brandon has come out basically of line a little bit and he's kind of back here against uh, this, actually, this road right here. He's back almost right there. As Kellogg is riding by, he's, he thinks that there's a hole there, that Brandon's not up in there, so he rides over here to tell uh, Rosecrans Thomas needs help, but there's also a hole down here in the line, and tells him, you know, he's between Reynolds and Woods, so they know it's Brandon. So, this, the thing about Rosecrans is he's not had any uh, sleep in about three days, so I always say, you know, the walking dead, you know, he's a zombie on a horse out here and one of the things he does well actually the thing that he does very bad here is at this point now he will issue the fatal order uh, fatal order of the day he will actually write a a order to thomas wood right here telling wood to close up on Reynolds and support him thinking that brandon's not there you know but by this time now brandon has pulled up here and actually, right before they get this, they, they being uh, Brandon and Reynolds, had already fought back part of A.P. Stewart's Confederates across the road there about where the uh, Georgia Monument is. And as they get this thing here now, um, Reynolds, Brandon, and Wood will start talking because right here in front of where we're standing here now, on this top of this hill here, there's Confederate skirmishers out firing into this, this line. So. If you've got skirmishers out front, what do you normally have back behind that? A lot of troops. A lot of troops. So you just got to think about all this that's going on here. Keep trying to keep this in, in your mind and what's happening. As these guys are talking about that that uh, order that Thomas Wood got, you know they're getting pot shots in from these uh, skirmishers here. Uh, so there's a guy out here, Frederick Marlston, with 100th Illinois here about 200 yards he's got sick and tired of that you know uh, he's having a bad day anyway and, and these skirmishers are just picking off his guys so without orders he'll take about 150 or 200 guys out of, of rank without permission and go out across that field there pushing those skirmishers back across the road and into the woods now like I said a lot of a lot of troops back behind those skirmishers Longstreet has got here on the on the field now he got here that night about midnight He's got 11,000 troops gathered in those in the woods right there, right inside the woods on the other side of Lafayette Road. So, as this here is going on, they take off across there, um, and well, actually not at this very moment. 
they're talking about this and, and, and McCook comes up on the situation here and they're going over this order. You know, this can't be right. Something's very, very wrong. But McCook will say, oh, Rosie's in charge. Do what he says to do. So Thomas Wood will take this line right here and start moving uh, up to support, close up and support Reynolds as the, as the uh, command said. But think about that command. How confusing would that command be? Because you're actually being told to do two things at one time. If Thomas Wood is going to close up, now they're thinking that Brandon's not here. That's that's Rosecrans' thought. If he is going to close up on Reynolds, what's he going to do? What's that line going to do? Move right there where Brandon's at, basically. Close up on him. But he's also been told to support him. So what's, what is he going to do if he supports him? Get behind him. Get behind him. Get behind him. Get behind him. So, you know, if you're Thomas Wood, you're asking, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to close up or am I supposed to support? You know, mm -hmm. this is military life. This is not, you know. Uh, but anyway, Thomas Wood will move. Now, anybody got any idea how long this blue line is right here? It is seven football fields long. Whoa. That's the hole that's going to be opened up here. So just about the time this guy, this last guy on this blue line basically gets across this road right here, uh, that is the moment in time that Bar Barleston goes out with those 200, 200 guys that runs across the road there. Um, I can just imagine, I always kind of get the, the thought of, of David running up against Goliath, mm -hmm. you know. Like 11,000 troops. <laughs> 200, 11,000. So that is the moment in time also that Longstreet says charge. <laughs> this is all just, you know, this is just pure faith, pure luck. So you got to imagine what it's going to look like, too. It's, you know, if, if, if there's one part of this battle that I would like to have seen, this, is, this was it. It's not that 11,000 men come rushing out of that woods there, just a mass of oncoming soldiers. Those guys are going to come out in, in columns. There are going to be 11,000 of them I mean, all together. There are going to be 3,000 troops come out, front rank, rear rank, in this big line coming across here. There's going to be about a 100, 150 yard gap. There's going to be another 3,000, another gap, another 3,000, another gap, and the other 2,000 is going to come through here. They're not going to come through here tiptoeing either. What are they doing? Charging. Charging, doing the... Yeah. Oh, yeah. So now the Union right here, they said it, it just basically dissolved very, very quickly. But the other thing is too, I guarantee you when the first 3,000 popped out, this is just a little scope of woods here and it goes out into the fields of the McDonald farm there. Old Rosie, you remember, was up there on top of the hill there. I guarantee you, and I, told, I, I described him a while ago as a, as a zombie on a horse, hadn't slept in about three days. First 3,000 Confederates pop out of those woods right there, I guarantee you each eye is about this big around. They said he looked and he's a devout Catholic. They said he crossed himself and said, looked at his staff and said, if you fear for your life, you better leave this place. <laughs> a lot of people said he left that place, but actually what he did, he got on his horse and he rode over here to the Union right trying to rally these troops here. But I always say that it was kind of like him standing in front of the door of Target on Black Friday morning. <laughs> he just got pushed right back, you know, back here. Uh, like I say, the Union right is going to dissolve very quickly. But the thing about it is, now where's Wilder at during this time? Wilder on the south side of the battlefield. He's kind of the south and, and west side. He is kind of today. He's outside of the park, just kind of south and, and west of where the Water Brigade Monument is. He's up on that hill there. He's been held in reserve there after this thing that happened the day before. So he starts riding this way. He knows something is not happening very uh, right. So he starts this way, but with Rosecrans staff is Assistant Secretary of War Charles Dana. Well, Dana's a pretty smart guy. He wants out of this mess here. Uh, this is not going right at all. So what he will do, you know, he's down here from Washington. He's he's watching this army, and I, I'm sure he's reporting back, you know, uh, what he's seeing to Washington. And 
now he is going to go, he's going to be the one that goes and finds Wilder and says, hey, you and your men are going to escort me, the general, and the staff back to Chattanooga. So pulls Wilder and all those men with all those Spencers off of this battlefield mm. to escort them back. Yeah. How about a smart man now? I'm going to be escorted off this battlefield in safety. I am going to get the man that has the best firepower mm. that there is on the battlefield. So just imagine how many lives that saved right here at Chickamauga. Mm. I dare say if that one thing had not have happened, Gettysburg would not have been the bloodiest three-day battle mm. of the war. It would have been Chickamauga. So right is gone. Now the left over here, uh, what's going to happen here? They said a lot of these guys here. And, and you got to think about just how how shocking this was. Uh, this to this a thing like this to happen to this magnitude. You know, I, I heard the the term shock and awe during the Iraq campaign. That's the first time I ever heard that. That was shock and awe mm -hmm. on September twentieth, eighteen sixty three, right here. So those guys, a lot of them just threw their packs down, their rifles down, and they started heading yonder way. Mm -hmm. A lot of those guys too are packing those old guns and they're going backwards like this and they're trying to hold that guy in front of me off trying to kill him before he kills me. But the thing that happens, of course, when these all these 11,000 troops go come across here, some of them are going to veer off and take care of that Union, right? But the majority is going to go out here into this field and the turn, the tide of the, war, the battle is going to start turning to the right. Now, if you're Braxton Bragg, is that the way you want to start pushing the enemy? Of course, Chattanooga. You're pushing that enemy to the right, to the north, towards Chattanooga. So what we're going to do now is we're going to leave here and we're basically going to follow those soldiers' footsteps from here back over to Snodgrass Hill. But what I want you to be aware of too as we travel, and all these monuments that we've seen here is, you know, the lack of them over here mm -hmm. until we get to Snodgrass Hill. I think that's actually telling us just how fluid this thing is going. There's not time to stand there and do something heroic and have mm -hmm. a monument put in your mm -hmm. honor there. You will see the South Carolina monument up there on the hill and you'll see some little monuments like this across over there where Mendenhall's battery was. Uh, but you, the one that's most important, I think it tells the story is the little fingerboard, a little hand like this right here, pointing to the west, and on it it says to the place where nine Union guns were captured. If you lose nine Union guns, things ain't going your way if you're, if you're with the Union. And I think that's just like I say, how quick everything's happening. Uh, these guys are focused on what's right in front of them. And we'll talk about that a little bit more here when we get over to Snodgrass Hill. So, 